Now I'd like to introduce our speaker, uh, Professor Rajan Patel, Ph.D. is a search scientist at Google, uh, where he has led several successful projects resulting in the integral use of live traffic experiments in search quality evaluation. He is also a statistician on the team that developed the Google, Google Flu Trends, uh, obviously been busy uh, of recent times. It's a powerfully uh, a powerful uh, available tool which mines Google search logs for flu-related activity and estimates influenza-like illness rates in each of the 50 U.S. states. He developed a model uh, which uses queries to predict influenza-like illness rates. A paper on this research, Detecting Influenza Epidemics Using Search Engine Query Data, was published in 2008 in Nature. Prior to joining Google, Dr. Patel worked at Amgen Incorporated as a senior biostatistician and then as a biostatistics manager. While he was at Amgen, he conducted several statistical analyses for early phase clinical trials and preclinical trials. Dr. Patel is currently an adjunct professor in biostatistics at Emory University, where he received his Ph.D. from biostatistics department. While at Emory, he developed novel statistical methods to analyze functional connectivity of the brain using functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI, data. He's also a visiting instructor here in the Department of Statistics at Stanford University. Now I'd like to turn over the floor to Dr. Patel. Hello. Welcome to Data Mining, the tool of the information age revolution. So to motivate today's webinar, I wanted to start with a quote from one of Google's co-founders, Sergey Brin. Every year, Sergey writes a letter to, to shareholders and the general public called the Founder's Letter. And in this year's letter, he explicitly mentioned data mining. So Sergey said, just a few months ago, we released Google Flu Trends, a service that uses our logs data to predict flu incidents weeks ahead of estimates by the Centers for Disease Control. It's amazing how existing data set typically used for improving search quality can be brought to bear on a seemingly unrelated issue and can help to save lives. I believe this sort of approach can do even more, going beyond monitoring to inferring potential causes of cures and disease. This is just one example of how large data sets, such as search logs, coupled with powerful data mining, can improve the world while safeguarding privacy. So hopefully that shows how important data mining can be and uh, what what great tools can come out of uh, out of data mining. So what is data mining? Depending upon who you ask, you'll hear many different definitions. Uh, so I'll just provide one. Coming from a statistical background, my definition might be different than someone else's. Uh, but but here's the definition that's used in uh, the textbook that we'll be using for the Stats 202 class. Data mining is the product process of automatically discovering useful information in large data repositories. So the key, one of the key words there is automatically, and another key word there is large data repositories. And those are typically uh, the, the, two, the two aspects most commonly associated with data mining. So on the bottom right-hand side of this slide, I give you the process of uh, a typical data mining uh, solution. Typically, when people talk about data mining or teach data mining in a class, they focus on the, uh, the aspect of it where you have your pre-processed data and you apply different methods, such as those that we'll talk about today, uh, like clustering, classification, regression, association analysis, uh, Bayesian methods, etc., uh, to find, uh, to, to build a model, interpret data, and evaluate your data. However, in the applied world, when you're really doing data mining, the process is a lot more involved and a lot more in-depth. You have a large data repository from which uh, you need to select appropriate data, pre-process that data, and develop the attributes that you'll use to actually data mine uh, before you can actually apply some of the uh, algorithms that we commonly talk about in data mining. So if you notice, uh, there's an arrow pointing from the problem question of interest to uh, the data repository. And that arrow points after the data repository has been uh, generated. So why does the problem formulation come after the data? And this is one thing that separates data mining from, uh, from other 
hypothesis testing frameworks or, or, or learning frameworks, um, the data is often there before you uh, you formulate the question of interest. So this is the difference between hypothesis testing versus hypothesis generation. In data mining, we often uh, generate hypotheses, whereas, for example, in uh, clinical trials research or other areas, you might test hypotheses, whether a drug is good for a patient or not. You would test that hypothesis, collect the data, and analyze that hypothesis. So you often don't have control over what your data looks like. And because of that, the selection, the pre-processing, the transformation steps are all critical in transforming that data to a format that's most useful for you. So before moving on, I wanted to give the example of Google Flu Trends. So our goal in the Flu Trends group was to estimate flu rates in 50 U.S. states using Google search query patterns. So Google has uh, this large database of search queries issued by people just like yourself from all over the world. And we felt that there's a, a powerful signal there that could be mined and could, be, could help uh, the general public uh, for the cause of public health. So the data in our case, and this is, of course, an abbreviated view of the original data, is each each search query that we receive, the timestamp uh, that it came in, and the location from which it was issued. So typically, with some granularity, we're able to determine with a level of confidence where a search query came from. So our original data looks something like this. But before going forward, we wanted to select out just queries that came from the U.S. because our initial goal was to just look at queries or, or queries associated with flu that, that come from the U.S. And not only that, but we wanted to look at queries that occurred a certain number of times because what our interest was was to find patterns of query, patterns, uh, queries that had patterns that matched uh, flu-like illness rates. And uh, during the pre-processing phase, we transformed our data into a time series for each location where a location was a U.S. state so that each query had a time series of how many times it occurred uh, over the last five years in that state. And then we rolled that up so that each the counts were done at a weekly basis because the, the training data provided by the Centers for Disease Control uh, had that time resolution as well. So we did all of this. We actually did uh, uh, quite a bit more in terms of spam uh, removal and um, and spike removal and news news removal as well uh, before even beginning the data mining process. At this point, we we started uh, running our data mining model, which which is, is similar to a, 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 a linear regression model to find queries that correlated with our uh, ILI rate truth data. And then finally showed that the model actually can estimate flu-like illness very well over the course of an unseen season. So this is the process we use to develop Google Flu Trends. It's a fairly standard data mining process, but I wanted to illustrate that some of the important um, steps that we took happened well before uh, the, uh, the data mining step itself, where we, we actually used these correlative methods to identify flu-related queries. So uh, before we go further, I want to discuss a little bit what we'll talk about today. Um, first, we'll give some, some more industry and academic examples of data mining, then talk about what is and what isn't data mining, and briefly discuss the origins of data mining, identifying types of data mining, and uh, introduce some methodology often used in data mining. We'll go into more detail on the methodology in the SAS 202 class this summer, but I just wanted to introduce the methodology a little bit today. Uh, finally, we'll talk about some of the challenges uh, remaining in data mining. So what are some examples of data mining? So Safeway, which is a big retail grocery store, uh, can use your purchase data. And um, so uh, if you've noticed, Safeway can provide you these uh, discount cards where when you, when you swipe them, you often get a discount on some of their products. And what that helps Safeway do is uh, 
track what you're purchasing and uh, and help present you with relevant coupons when you've purchased certain items. So they use a data mining methodology to provide those coupons to you and they use and and provide those uh, those discount cards to users to help better serve better serve customers. Similarly, Amazon uses your browse history and your purchase history to identify items that you might like or items that, that you may want to purchase. And that's, uh, that's helped separate Amazon from its competitors in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of converting page views into purchases. Uh, State Farm, oops, State Farm and, uh, which is an insurance company, uh, as do all insurance companies, build models uh, of your likelihood of filing a claim and how much that claim might be based on people like yourself, so predictive models, so that they can help uh, better estimate what your premiums should be. Uh, furthermore, an academic example of data mining uh, that that I was involved with, with uh, a few years ago was is to find the functionally connected brain regions from functional MRI data. So the scope of data mining is far and wide, from neuroscience, insurance, retail, groceries, Google searches, other searches, um, the, there's quite a bit that can be done. Uh, so the term data mining is very, very broad in scope. What is and what isn't data mining? So, so remember, the definition, again, is given at the bottom. Data mining is the process of automatically discovering useful information in large data re repositories. Um, but the process is often quite complex. So looking up a phone number in a directory, is that data mining? Well, a directory is a large data repository, and uh, looking up a phone number could be automatic if the directory had um, some search functionality. But but it, that's not really data mining. It's not We're not just discovering useful information from a large source. We're just finding... Uh, re getting returned at some of the data that's in that repository. And uh, another example with data mining is, in, is issuing a search engine query for the, for the query Amazon. Well, the search engine might be using data mining to return those results, but you're not mining for data by just issuing a query. There's something more complex to data mining that makes it what it is. So, for example, if you used information in a directory to find which names are more prevalent in certain U.S. locations, that could be an example of data mining. So if you were able to find that, oh, O'Connelly is common in Boston, um, or Johnson is common in Alabama, or something like that, then that would be an example of data mining. Uh, furthermore, grouping together similar documents returned by a search engine. So let's say uh, Google returned uh, documents relating to the Amazon rainforest and Amazon.com, how could you use the information in those documents to group them into like categories? Um, that process could be considered data mining. Obviously, the definition of data mining and what is and what isn't data mining might differ depending upon what, uh, what perspective you're coming from. But, um, but uh, from, from the perspective we're coming from today, those are the examples we'll use. Uh, so some of the origins of data mining, uh, data mining draws ideas from machine learning, artificial intelligence, pattern recognition, statistics, uh, computer science in general, um, and the databases. So if you look at the Venn diagram on the right, so I, I'm a statistician. So, so for me, data mining comes, comes from the statistics, uh, per, from a statistics perspective, from computer scientists, it comes from a machine learning perspective. So you might learn a little bit more about boosting and bagging and um, various machine learning techniques, support vector regression, et cetera, that come from, from this side. From the statistics side, you learn a little bit about uh, logistic regression and linear models, um, et cetera. And the database side, uh, frankly, I don't know too much about, but um, the database side uh, contributes to the enormity of the data and helps solve the problems with regards to scale. Um, so some, some, some of the traditional techniques in each of those uh, three areas uh, are maybe unsuitable because, well, in statistics, when you have too much data or it has uh, too high dimensionality, a lot of the statistical methods begin to break down. Um, so that's why... Uh, combining with machine learning, artificial intelligence, database systems, 
uh, data mining can help uh, answer some of the problems with data of that size. So standard data mining tasks can be broken down into two groups, descriptive tasks and predictive tasks. So descriptive tasks are typically defined uh, as when you are looking for human interpretable patterns that describe the data. So you're not necessarily trying to make predictions from the data, but you're trying to understand the data better. Uh, so for example, clustering. If you have a set of observations and you want to group them into different groups, but you don't know necessarily what those groups are in a predefined manner, uh, clustering can help. Association analysis, we'll talk about a little bit later, as well as clustering, uh, where you find patterns in, in sets of items that are in your observations. And predictive tasks, which are, which may be more commonly associated with data mining, where you use some variables in your data set to predict unknown or future values of these variables, of other variables. So, for example, can you classify whether uh, someone is more likely to cheat on their taxes uh, based on the data you have about them? Or regression uh, is an example from the flu trends. Uh, re re regression is, uh, is the, t the type of data mining we use for flu trends where we estimated the influenza-like illness rate given uh, flu or given search query data. So we'll talk a little bit about clustering, uh, association analysis, and classification today. In STATS 202, we'll go into all four, uh, as well as anomaly detection, um, and we'll go into quite a bit of detail uh, into regression, um, talk about different regression approaches, uh, classification, we'll talk about different uh, classification algorithms. With clustering, we'll talk about uh, hierarchical clustering, k-means clustering, uh, how to identify the optimal number of clusters in your data, um, and we'll spend a little bit of time uh, on association analysis as well. So we'll go into far more detail on not only the algorithms behind each of these data mining tasks, but we'll go into examples and learn how to actually um, uh, how to actually implement these data mining tasks in, in a, st a statistical programming language called R. All right. So, so let's start with classification, uh, which was one of the predictive type tasks for data mining. So given a collection of records, or so a training set, where we know the class of a particular record, um, can we find a model for one of the attributes uh, that's a function for the other attributes that classifies new records or classifies that uh, new records uh, as accurately as possible for that class attribute. And then is, typically we split our data into a training set and a test set where we're able to use the class attributes of the training set uh, to train our model. And then we see how well we're able to predict our uh, predict observations in uh, the class attribute that we want to predict for using our test set. So let's, get, let's start with an example. So each record in this data set is uh, information about an individual. And what we'd like to be able to predict is whether they're likely to cheat on their taxes or not. So the IRS builds models every year, and uh, or they build a model, and try to identify who is more likely to cheat on their taxes than others so that they can target their audits more effectively. If they randomly audited people, chances are they, uh, they would get a lot of false positives. So this way, building a model, they're able to allocate their, those, uh, their resources more effectively. So some of the attributes they use to build their model are, well, did the user or did the uh, did the person get a refund this year? And that would be a categorical attribute. Did, is the person single or married or divorced? Uh, is the, what's the taxable income of the individual? And that would be a continuous attribute. So in our data set, we have two categorical attributes and one continuous attribute. And the class attribute that we're trying to predict is whether that individual uh, what is likely to cheat on their taxes or not. So in our training data, we actually have truth data as to whether those individuals did cheat on their data or, or, or on their taxes or not. 
and we would like to build a classifier, and uh, essentially in this case it would be a logistic regression model to determine whether uh, unforeseen observations uh, would, or un un unforeseen individuals would cheat on their uh, on their taxes or not. So we split our data into a training set and a test set and to see how well we were able to predict uh, whether individuals cheated or not on the test set. So the classifier in this case could, you know, from my perspective, uh, logistic regression. You can also use support vector machines. Uh, there's quite a few different classifiers that, that are out there, um, and we'll talk more about that in Stats 202. Unfortunately, we don't have time to go into uh, specific classifiers today. Another classification example that I worked on uh, while at Emory is uh, classifying whether microcalcifications micro in the breast are benign or malignant. So in this example, the data is initially a, uh, a, a digital mammography uh, image, which are very high resolution images where each pixel is often about 50 micrometers in size and the image is about 2,500 by 2,500 pixels. And from these images, it's not difficult to identify where certain microcalcifications are using existing techniques, but it is a little bit more challenging to identify whether those micro microcalcifications or are benign or malignant. Um, and it's, it's critical for the patient to identify whether they're benign or malignant because that could be the difference between uh, having to undergo surgery or not. Uh, one of the most important steps in classifying microcalcifications is coming up with the attributes that you'll use to uh, classify, uh, to build your classification model. So one particular attribute you could use is the grayscale intensity of the microcalcification. Another one is what's the circumference to area ratio of the microcalcification. So for example, um, the most malignant uh, microcalcificant microcalcifications often have a very high circumference to area ratio, whereas uh, benign microcalcifications tend to have lower micro uh, have lower ratios. Um, another attribute that that you might uh, derive is the major axis to minor axis radio ratio, where the major axis is the length of the longest uh, point in the calcification and the minor axis is the uh, width of the microcalcification. And then also you could use the pixel intensity histogram of the microcalcification. Uh, there's, there's quite a few attributes you can use, and you don't have to uh, find the attributes that certainly are correlated with whether the tumor is benign or whether the microcalcification is benign or malignant. But you, the, the goal is to find as many attributes as you can, and the classifier can help determine which ones are useful and, uh, and how useful each one is. This is an example of where a lot of the work uh, goes into finding the attributes and not necessarily building a great uh, a classifier given attributes. So a descriptive technique for data mining is, uh, one of the descriptive techniques we'll talk about today is clustering. So what's clustering? So given a set of observations, each of them having a set of attributes and a similarity score, a similarity measure uh, among those sets of attributes, find clusters that observations in one cluster are more similar to another and observations in separate clusters are less similar to another. So the goal of clustering is to group observations that have similar have a similar set of attributes into different clusters. Uh, in, or into into clusters uh, where each within each cluster observations have similar sets of attributes. And there's different similarity measures that you can use to determine whether uh, how how disparate a set of attributes are. Euclidean distance is one. Um, Mahalanobi distance, which um, adjusts for the correlation across uh, pairs of attributes, and other other problem specific type distance measures would work as well. Um, in, in SAS 202, we'll go into more detail as to what Euclidean distance is, how it's calculated, how it's used, uh, how what Mahalanobi distance is, and go into other distance measures as well. But coming up with a distance metric uh, to define how disparate attributes are uh, is an important part of the clustering process. 
So here's just a visualization of clustering, of, of three clusters of observations uh, where you, you want to maximize the intra-cluster distance, so the, the uh, sorry, the intra-cluster distance, so the distance uh, between two clusters, and minimize the intra-cluster distance, so the distance between observations in the same cluster. Uh, in SAS202, we'll go over a couple different clustering methods, uh, one of which is k-means, where you pre-specify the number of clusters in the uh, in the data set, and uh, k-means will will arrange the observations into clusters that best minimize intra-cluster distance and maximize intra-cluster distance. Um, and then there's another uh, family of clustering algorithms uh, called hierarchical clustering, and we'll talk about agglomerative hierarchical clustering uh, in the class, uh, where you don't pre-specify the number of clusters, but the clustering uh, occurs in, in something called a dendrogram, and eventually you cut off the dendrogram at the number of clusters that uh, is most appropriate. And we'll talk about how to do that in the class. So another another clustering example is um, in the uh, in Google Flu Trends, we wanted to be able to cluster search queries that have similar volume patterns. So we wanted to be able to understand well which queries have similar user intent, which queries go have increase in volume at the same time and decrease in volume at the same time. So on this plot, I'm showing uh, the the normalized search volume for the query flu symptoms as well as the normalized search volume for the query influenza. And you can actually make plots like this yourself if you go to, uh, to Google Trends, which I believe is at google.com slash trends. Um, you can actually even download this data in CSV format and uh, do your own data mining with queries uh, of, of interest as well. But the idea behind clustering similar search queries is, well, it, can I find queries, a set of queries that might be news related, or can I find a set of queries that have some specific pattern that I can I can attribute to uh, to some other effect, and either use those queries in my in my flu model or omit those queries from my flu model. And so we did use quite a bit of clustering uh, in Google Flu Trends. And in this, uh, when clustering flu queries, the attributes are the query counts or the normalized query counts at each time point. So you have quite a few attributes, and they're highly correlated with each other. So you would want to adjust for the correlation uh, across time points. But the attributes, so we actually had weekly data going back four or five years, so we had two or 300 attributes in, in our data. And that's when the scale of the data begins to grow beyond what is typically uh, typically used in statistics. So finally, uh, association rule discovery uh, is another descriptive task where given a set of records, each containing some number of items from a collection, can you produce dependency rules which will predict the occurrence of an item based on occurrences of other items? So, so association rule discovery is important for, so for example, uh, Amazon.com, or so, let's say this example is Safeway, a grocery store, where user one uh, purchases a subset of all of the items for sale at Safeway. He purchases bread, Coke, and milk. And user two, or, or shopper number two, purchases beer and bread. Uh, shopper three purchases beer, Coke, diaper, diapers and milk, and shopper four purchases a set of items, shopper five purchases a set of items. And what we'd want to be able to do is discover uh, relationships between the items. When somebody purchases milk, are they more likely to purchase, purchase Coke? When somebody purchases a diaper and milk together, are they more likely to purchase beer? Uh, so let's, let's go into an example from, uh, from, from Safeway. So Let's let's see if so. Let the rule to uh, discovered be uh, like bagels uh, to potato chips. So bagels is in the antecedent, and potato chips is in the consequent. So having potato chips in the consequent allows us to be able to determine what can be do done to boost its sales. So potato chips in the consequent, we see that bagels is in the antecedent. 
if we sell more bagels, then we can sell more potato chips. With bagels in the antecedent, we can be we can use that to see which products would be affected if this store dis- discontinues selling bagels. So if if Safeway no no longer sold bagels, then the sales of potato chips would be affected. Uh, affected. And finally, if you had bagels in the antecedent and potato chips in the consequent, you can see what other products should be sold with bagels to promote the sale of potato chips. So, for example, if Coke uh, and bagels were in the antecedent, then uh, both of those would be would affect the uh, the sales of potato chips. So this is how association analysis and association rules are often used at um, at retailers. Like not only Safeway, of course, but Amazon and and, uh, and almost every retail in the world. And it, it helps identify uh, which other items might be uh, might be might the uh, shopper want to buy or uh, to present items to them as in the form of coupons or you know in, in Amazon's case as you know items you might you may like they use an association analysis to be, to do that so finally uh so some of the challenges remaining in data mining so data the data is often very complex and very noisy as you remember from the beginning of the talk the data is often uh, often exists before you are you develop the problem or question of interest so you aren't able to collect the data yourself in the format you want and um, and have complete control of the data. And converting this complex and noisy data into something that's useful and usable to you in terms of ha- what attributes uh, that it has and and uh, and so forth is a very important process in data mining, and it's one of the, oftentimes the most difficult and overlooked steps. And the same goes with data quality. Uh, so privacy preservation is often is, is recently become uh, v- very important. For example, with the uh, launch of Google Flu Trends, we're using individual search query data. So, so search queries that individuals issued, and you have to be very conscientious about the privacy of those users. So we went to great lengths to anonymize the data and make and aggregate the data to make sure that no one individual um, could be identified from from any of the data that we use. Lately, streaming data has become uh, more and more important. There's a microblogging service called Twitter, which has exploded in 2009. And uh, streaming data in the form of microblogs and and Twitter searches um, are becoming uh, uh, more and more, the, uh, I guess, more and more prevalent. And Twitter is going to, Twitter and, and other similar services are going to uh, use data mining quite a bit to identify what hot topics are, hot trends are, uh, what useful web pages are, et cetera, to better serve their users. And uh, an, an issue that Twitter will have to deal, deal with, as does Google and other, and other companies, is scalability of their services. So um, it's important for data mining, especially with the size of the data sets and the increasing size of the data sets, that scalability of the algorithms and of the, the platforms with which you implement those algorithms um, can, can grow to meet your needs. And then finally, uh, from a statistician's perspective, the dim- dimensionality of the data often causes uh, uh, the greatest concerns with the methodology. So developing methodology that scales with the dimensionality of the data is critically important. So I want to thank thank you for attending the class today. Um, I believe Paul will follow will follow up with some uh, some comments, and then I'll begin to answer some of the questions that have been queued up over the next uh, uh, five to ten minutes. Thanks, Dr. Patel. Thank you very much. Uh, and now what I'd like to do is go over some background on the Stanford Center for Professional Development and how you can actually enroll in Dr. Patel's course, Data Mining and Analysis. First, uh, the Stanford Center for Professional Development has been delivering education to industry as the bridge between Stanford and industry for over 40 years now. Uh, We deliver a number of uh, graduate courses, uh, certificates, and programs about which I will speak in a few moments, and also professional education. Our goal in doing this is not only to extend the graduate Stanford-level content to maintain the vitality of uh, the Silicon Valley, but also to allow you as individuals 
to stay on top of your game. Um, we have a number of different offerings, uh, and I'd like to walk through those. Uh, our center offers about 230 graduate courses every year. Uh, those can be taken in a variety of different options that you see here. Uh, the first is the non-degree option, where students, without submitting uh, uh, transcripts, uh, sorry, without submitting GREs and actually applying to the department, can simply submit a transcript to SCPD and gain access and take those courses for graduate credit at Stanford University. Students who per pursue this uh, can actually accumulate up to 18 units, which may be transferred in uh, to a variety of different graduate uh, master's degrees that we offer at Stanford. Students can also uh, bundle those courses. Uh, the SCPD has worked with various departments, including statistics, to create uh, graduate certificates. Um, data mining and analysis, for instance, is part of the certificate in data mining and applications offered by the Department of Statistics. These graduate certificates are focused in a specific area, uh, such as the one I just mentioned, and comprise typically of three to five graduate courses. Uh, this allows uh, the individual who may already even have a PhD to get some additional education in a domain. We know uh, one thing is certain, that education and uh, these various uh, areas continue to evolve, and this is a great way to demonstrate how you can remain up to date uh, to your teammates as well as to your boss and others in your group. Finally, we offer um, two, two different uh, a master's degree, which is called the uh, Honors Cooperative Program. Uh, if you're interested in this, uh, candidates must apply, like any other graduate student, uh, to the Department of Interest, uh, and the SCPD allows this uh, uh, candidate, uh, once accepted, to participate on a part-time basis Students can take up to five years to complete that degree. And as I mentioned, uh, if you had participated in the non-degree option, up to 18 units can transfer into that master's degree. We also offer an audit program where students who want to just observe the content can participate, and there is no credit associated with that. The Stanford Center for Professional Development is one of the leaders in distance education. Uh, since 1999, we've been offering master's degrees in engineering and, uh, and other disciplines at a distance. We do this by creating uh, lectures, which are in, offered in nine television classrooms here on Stanford's campus. We capture those and extend those on a streaming basis. Uh, those typically are offered um, about an hour after the class has occurred. Students uh, engage with faculty via email. And also, um, if the class has homeworks and assignments, those are completed uh, typically online and through the Stanford Center for Professional Development's uh, distribution unit. Finally, if there is a test required, uh, uh, we do require that companies uh, 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 identify an exam monitor, who may not be your spouse or best friend, uh, to provide uh, some uh, secure way of making sure that the exam is taken by the student in the time allotted. Once you have uh, been able to identify the, the course uh, of interest, uh, say the course that uh, we've shared with you today, um, I'm going to walk through some of the ways you'll need to engage with us uh, for a course enrollment. Uh, the summer quarter is now open and will remain open until June 17. Um, students can enroll in a variety of different ways, uh, the most common of which is uh, the non-degree option uh, category. If uh, you are, uh, as you can see here, if you belong to a member company, as identified on SCPD's website, um, you have a slightly better uh, per unit cost than if you do not, so I would encourage you to look at that. Uh, if you're interested in auditing, uh, again, the member company uh, has some slight advantage. Um, the nice thing here is that this allows you to participate uh, and observe the course, just as you might uh, when you were once on a university campus, uh, not engage with the faculty member or the class per se, but get a chance to experience and observe the content. Um, once you uh, uh, have decided you would like to participate, uh, we actually have in SCPD's new website 
uh, something called the MyStanford Connection. Uh, we encourage uh, you, whether or not you are uh, actually actually interested in pursuing a, a graduate course, to enroll there. We often uh, extend free seminars, webinars, and archive webinars, such as the one you've experienced today, uh, and MyStanford Connection will allow you access to those. It will also allow you the ability to register for courses uh, graduate courses uh, through SCPD. Um, what you do is you go to our website. Uh, once you're uh, logged in and have your user ID, you can uh, do a quick search, for instance, on STATS202, and you can simply click Enroll in this section, uh, and you'll see the various options. This will drive you, uh, once completed, uh, we encourage you to click on the, the cart, very much like an Amazon.com experience, where you can uh, Click on that cart to make sure you have the right items and proceed to uh, checkout. Um, your page will look very much like this, where you can identify the correct category based on member company. Uh, you're taking this for non-degree option credit, an audit option, and so on. And then you can uh, proceed to, to checkout uh, to the tuition payment screen. Uh, I've uh, given you some sense of the SCPD and how we operate. Um, what I'm interested in knowing from you right now is how, much, how many of you are, are uh, interested in taking data mining and analysis uh, stats 202? It would be helpful uh, to, to, to know that. Um, I see some people registering or, or uh, voting right now. I'm going to give you a few more seconds to, uh, to click in before I close the polls. Again, the, the categories are I'm interested in taking this course uh, this summer. I'm interested in taking the course next time it is offered. I have some questions. Please contact me. Or no, I'm not interested at this time. Okay, the selections are still coming in. I'm going to uh, close the polls now. Uh, you can uh, see that uh, eight of you are interested in taking this this summer. Uh, Seems like 11 are interested and also 11 are not interested. We certainly uh, can create these webinars to give you a glimpse into the state of the art, uh, and we also hope that this may drive some interest uh, to the courses that SCPD offers. I did want to highlight two upcoming webinars. Uh, on May 14, we have a, a program with my colleague Belinda Quo, which will give you some perspective not only on the graduate programs about which you heard today, but also the professional education offerings uh, where we address uh, content uh, for uh, engineers, technology managers, uh, professionals, and executives. Uh, so we have a full complement of offerings. That's tomorrow, May 14 at 11.30. And then in two weeks, we have a, uh, a webinar uh, featuring Professor Simon Wong and Stephen Boyd, who will be talking about future opportunities of electrical engineering, why EE matters. Uh, that's at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight. We hope that you might, uh, you or your colleagues might join us uh, for one or, or more of these webinars uh, to learn more about our, our offerings. Finally, we encourage you uh, to enroll in Dr. Patel's course. Uh, this link will be uh, provided here uh, for a few moments. Um, we do appreciate your taking the time here today. Um, we do have a, a number of questions coming in, and uh, we would like to, to, uh, to actually try to, to answer those. Uh, I'm going to actually turn the, the floor over to Dr. Uh, Patel, uh, who may be able to answer uh, a couple of these questions uh, live. We have a few more minutes. And if you do have questions for Dr. Patel, please uh, send them in now. We have a, an, an active Q&A session. So the first question uh, that we received was, with regard to the data to data filtering, is your data skewed or swamped once an event like the current swine flu occurs and numerous U.S. viewers conduct related queries through Google? So this question is about the Google Flu Trends product and uh, whether issues, I guess, news-related events uh, such as uh, the current swine flu um, affect the, the data in the model. So part of the model, uh, before we actually uh, use the model, we filter our query stream for news-related events, and we have a separate machine learning uh, pipeline that identifies queries that may have been likely issued due to um, due to uh, due to a news-related event, and we filter those queries out. So oftentimes, uh, you know, most of the time, this works pretty well. Uh, sometimes we let something slip through, but um, it's a very important goal of ours for the system to work, not only uh, when there isn't a particular news, news uh, 
related event going on, but even during um, during something like the swine flu uh, that we've seen over the last month or so. Uh, the second question is, for SETS 202, is a prior background in R or other general programming language recommended for the course? So uh, experience with programming languages is recommended. Uh, however, experience with R in particular uh, or any particular programming language isn't, isn't necessary. And if you, if you don't know R, if you haven't used R before, don't worry about it. But hopefully you've used some, some statistical tool before. Maybe, it, it, maybe it's R or MATLAB or SAS, even Excel, um, well, more advanced Excel, um, or other programming languages. So that, uh, because we'll, we'll dive into R, but I'll, I will provide a background, uh, with, in, to R as well as Excel. Um, but hopefully you, uh, can get off the ground, uh, running in terms of how programming languages, uh, typically work. Okay. The textbook for Stats 202 will be the same textbook that was used last year. It's called Introduction to Data Mining by Tan Steinbach and Kumar. So again, it's Introduction to Data Mining by Tan Steinbach and Kumar. If you uh, if you go to Amazon or Google and type in Introduction to Data Mining, Tan Steinbach and Kumar, you'll find the book uh, listed there. Uh, the next question is, what pre-class reading can a student conduct prior to enrolling in the STATS 202 class? So I think in order to prepare for the class and uh, to, to get yourself up to speed, um, as, as much as you can get familiar with R uh, as a statistical tool, that would be optimal because then you'll be able to focus on the data mining methodologies themselves and not necessarily have to worry about having to learn a programming language while trying to learn new uh, statistical methods and, or data mining methods. Um, other than that, uh, I don't think there's, there's too much that you'll have to read. Um, if you're interested in getting a broader background on uh, clustering, classification, association analysis, regression, et cetera, um, I, I, I would just say that, um, uh, you know, ser searching on the web, maybe Wikipedia, and reading a little bit about uh, what's out there m might help. Uh, what are the differences between SATS 202, 252, and 315B? Uh, Paul, can you answer that one? Um, well, I, we have a variety of different courses uh, in in STATS, um, and what I would encourage you to do is go to SCPD's website and do a compare and contrast uh, against those topics. I can tell you that STATS 252 uh, is quite a popular course and features a number of guest lectures talking about um, how they implement and use uh, statistical methods in their own business. Um, we are offering uh, 252 in the spring. Um, but with the others, I would have to defer to the, the various descriptions on SCPD's website, which are reasonably robust. I would also encourage uh, students, if you have questions, we can uh, direct them to our course advisor uh, for statistics, who is uh, quite good and, and will be quite quick uh, on the uptake uh, regarding any questions or issues. Ashish is a, a PhD candidate within statistics and is uh, reasonably uh, responsive uh, within the 24-hour um, business day. So if you have further questions, I would direct you there. The, uh, the one of the next questions, or actually the two next questions, have to do with the level of math background or stats background required for stats 202. Uh, will there be a review of key concepts? Um, so, so stats 202 is an introduction introductory course. So we will go over basics like you know how to make a histogram, how to visualize your data. Um, we'll we'll really take it from the top. So. I think that uh, the level of math background will be will be quite quite minimal. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about not having used advanced math concepts in the past. However, concepts like probability and uh, perhaps even conditional probability uh, might be worthwhile to review beforehand, um, especially as they come up in terms of um, in association analysis and 
and in logistic regression, et cetera. As an SPCD student, can I come to the classroom for SATS 202? Um, generally speaking, uh, it is up to the faculty member in the space in the room. Um, what we ask you to do is uh, submit your question uh, to the SCPD customer service link, which is on our website, and then we'll get that to Dr. Patel. Often the rooms are quite small in the summer, and uh, so we, we are just generally not sure about the room allocation and, and availability. It is indeed up to the professor. Uh, generally speaking, uh, students in the non-degree option category are encouraged to take courses at a distance. We have quite a robust enrollment in that category, and if every student showed up at one time, we have a, a, a real problem with the capacity for those students who are uh, on Stanford's campus. Uh, the master's degree uh, candidates are typically allowed to come uh, to Stanford's campus if they're local and, uh, again, if, uh, if the classroom allows. Um, with that, what I'd like to do is uh, thank you for your attendance and your questions. Um, today's presentation will be recorded and we'll be sending out the link to all of the attendees, including those who are unable to uh, show up. Uh, we encourage you to uh, extend th those links uh, to colleagues who may have missed the session. Uh, we do also welcome inquiries and follow-up. Um, there were many good questions. We'll be taking some of the questions uh, offline. And uh, we thank you for your attendance uh, to, on today's webinar. We look forward to seeing you in future uh, SCPD webinars, and we wish you a very good day. Thank you very much. All right.